what do you do when people don't read your script? What do you do when people don't read the narrative that you've already written in your mind about how your life is going to play out? What do you do when things don't go the way that you planned? Do you blow up like Naaman? Do you take it out on your family? Do you blame everyone else in your family except for yourself or everyone else at your work except for yourself? Now, I am a tightly wound type A person and I get worked up when things do not go according to my plan. But are we willing to pause and are we willing to admit that there is an inner leprosy in us all? If you would like weekly content that builds your faith and helps you walk out all that God has for your life, subscribe and be a part of Life Family. Have you ever found yourself in a situation where you had everything that you ever wanted but nothing that you needed? I think about the graduations that have taken place this past week across our state and our nation as tens of thousands of local kids graduated high school this week with all of their hopes and all of their dreams and all of their wants in front of them. I graduated high school in 1998 and at that time the only thing I wanted was to be a Division I college golfer. I know you're shocked because you look at me and you think he looks a lot more like a Division I college football player than a golfer, but if he wants to be a golfer and waste that God-given strength and mass, then okay. Hey, I hear you and I don't disagree, but God works in mysterious ways. My life centered around this singular goal and I leveraged everything to make it happen, and it did. My dream came true and it passed just as quickly. My dream to become a Division I golfer came true, but two years later, I had quit golf altogether, and I found myself at 20 years old realizing that my dream had come true. I had everything I ever wanted as an 18-year-old, but nothing that I actually needed, nothing that could satisfy my soul, nothing that could give me the identity and the purpose that I was looking for. In our story today, we're going to meet a man that I recognize, and maybe some of you will as well, because I feel like I've seen him in the mirror. This man had everything that anyone could ever want, but he had nothing that he needed, nothing that could save him from his current situation. This man's name is Naaman, and we find his story in 2 Kings chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. You can turn there with me now. It says, Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. Now, this phrase, great man, in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word ish gadol. Ish gadol. Everyone say ish gadol. Ish gadol. Now, this is a rare phrase. Now, we use the phrase great man or great woman to describe all kinds of people in our everyday life, but an ish gadol was a rare person. This phrase is only used five times in the entire Old Testament. So, Naaman is a rare bird here. He is an ish gadol. This verse also tells us that he was second in command in all of Aram because he was the commander of the army of Aram, second in power only to the king. So this was a man of great power, of great prestige, of great privilege and wealth and influence. And it says not only was he a great man, the verse goes on to say he was a valiant soldier. He was a great man, he was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. He was great. But, and if we're being honest, we all have buts. Not those kind, get your mind out of the gutter. (laughs) Talking about those traits or those qualities or those things that we feel disqualify us or kind of bristle up against what others see as being great in us. So Naaman, for him, his but was the fact that he was a mitzorah. The Hebrew word for leper is the word mitzorah. So he's an Ishkadol, he's a great man, but he's also a Mitzorah. And Naaman's beginning to discover this simple truth, that everything he ever wanted couldn't give him what he actually needed. And it reminds me of this incredible commencement speech that actor and comedian Jim Carrey gave a few years ago. He was addressing this group of graduates, and he looked at them and he said, I hope that every one of you gets everything you ever wanted so that you can realize that that's not the answer to anything. And he was speaking from experience, because for Jim Carrey, his entire life, all he ever wanted since he was a young kid was to be the most famous comedic actor in the world. And he had risen to the mountaintop in his profession. He was the highest paid comedic actor. He was the most recognizable comedic actor. He had everything he ever wanted, and he realized in that moment that it was not what he needed. It wasn't 
anything that could bring satisfaction to his heart and in his soul. And Naaman realizes this too. And I think this is a lie that we all believe, a lie that we believe that we can find fulfillment and things outside of God. The story goes on in verse two. It says, now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Uh, This captive, this servant girl was about 10 to 12 years old. We know this because of the Hebrew word that's used for girl here. And at some point in her life, there was a raid in Israel where she was ripped from her family and taken back to this country of Aram, and she was now serving in the house of the man who authorized the raid that led her to losing everything. Because as commander of the army of Aram, Naaman would have had to authorize any military action that would have taken place outside of the nation of Aram. So she is now serving in the house of this man that led her to losing everything, her family, her home, her friends, and her country. This is the situation she's in. And we also have to consider the the social structure of that time because as a slave, as a servant in the ancient world, you would have been at the very bottom of the social ladder. And as a woman who was a slave, you would have been even one rung lower on the social ladder. But as a young girl who was a slave, you would have been at the very bottom, only one rung above the animals. This is the situation this young girl finds herself in. And it's all because of Naaman. Verse 4 says, Naaman went to his master, so he listened to what this girl said and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Now it's important for us to pause to kind of understand terms here because we don't use phrases like shekels and talents in our everyday vernacular. But let's just consider just the gold in this text here. The amount of gold that Naaman is bringing with him is equivalent to 600 years salary for the average laborer in that part of the world at this time. 600 years salary, that's just the gold. Why is this important? Because Naaman's an ish gadol. And he's going to deal with this situation like he's dealt with every other situation in his life. He's going to deal with it by throwing his power around and his money around to get whatever he wants and what he needs. And notice what the king of Aram tells the king of Israel. He says, I am sending Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. Didn't the servant girl say that Naaman needed to go see the prophet that was in Israel and not the king? I wonder why we, like Naaman, run to kings and people in power instead of to God and to his people whenever we need to be healed. Because if we're honest, we're not too dissimilar from Naaman. Maybe it's because we believe the lies that the kings of our day, presidents, politicians, social media influencers, fill in the blank, can heal us by giving us purpose, and by giving us understanding of who we are. Spoiler alert, they can't. They never have been able to. The story has been the same for the past 3,000 years from Naaman to us today, but we still haven't learned, and we still run to the wrong places. The story goes on in verse 7. It says, As soon as the king of Israel read this letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel to me, to which we say, Try the decaf, brother. I mean, easy there. Lay off the Red Bull, okay? He's a little bit wound up here, a little worked up. But we have to understand the political situation of this day here. These two countries have been at war for a long time. So the king of Israel does not trust the motives of the the king of Aram. And he thinks he's kind of trying to provoke this new battle. So he's afraid here. But the king also recognizes his own limitations in this moment. He knows, "I I can't heal anyone. Only God can heal. So he feels trapped by this request. And so in an ancient sign of grief, he tears his robes as an outward sign of the inward pain that he's feeling in this moment. But here's where the story turns, because here's where we meet Elisha, the man of God, in verse 8. It says, when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. He says, send this Ish 
Gadol to me. And so we have this kind of crazy scene here because Naaman has this giant entourage made up of all of these men and their horses and their donkeys and all of these chariots that are loaded down with all of this gold and all of this silver. And they make this big scene by making this huge arrival outside of the hut where this little prophet would have, would have lived. This is a literary device used by the author because this scene in the ancient world would have been seen and read as being absurd because we have this small house, this small hut, this shack that this poor little prophet would have lived in and this massive entourage that Naaman is bringing there. It's this contrast that God wants us to see, the contrast that God speaks about in the scripture when he says that God uses the foolish to confound the wise, that God uses the small to confound the ishkadols of our world. And I love what happens next, because this is about to get wild. Verse 10, it says, Elijah, Elisha sent a servant, everyone say servant, to him to say, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your, your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Whoa. When you have an ishkadol standing at your door, you rise up and you greet the ishkadol. But Elisha sends this nameless, faceless, poor servant to greet this great man. Elisha sends this nobody to greet this somebody. And Naaman does not take this well. In verse 11, it says, but Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come to me and stand and call on the name of his Lord, uh, the Lord his God, and wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. He turned and went off in a rage. Elisha, or Naaman, is furious here. He feels disrespected. He feels dishonored because he's an Ishkadol. He's the second most important and second most powerful man in all of Aram. And he's thinking to himself, this little prophet who lives in this little hut won't pause his episode of Stranger Things long enough to get up and come out and greet me, an Ishkadol? He said, I was expecting this, this big show. I was expecting him to come out and kind of like Benny Hinn me or something. And it is a verb. It is a verb, by the way, in case you were wondering. He wanted everyone to see this spectacle. He said, I want everyone to see how important I am. He said, I thought, I thought, I think that I thought are two of the most dangerous words in the entire English language because the Bible says, the Lord says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. But Naaman's stuck in this line of thinking saying, I thought that things were gonna turn out this way. And he responds in this way. And I want us to see three quick things from Naaman's response here in verse 11. And the first is this, is when you are filled with pride, you write your own prescriptions. When your heart is filled with pride, you write your own prescriptions. Leprosy in this story is simply symbolic of sin. And for Naaman, his sin was pride, and his pride let him, led him to write a script for how this story would play out. Because Naaman had already written the narrative out in his mind for the way that this should play out. What do you do when people don't read your script? What do you do when people don't read the narrative that you've already written in your mind about how your life was going to play out? What do you do when things don't go the way that you planned? Do you blow up like Naaman? Do you take it out on your family? Do you blame everyone else in your family? except for yourself or everyone else at your work, except for yourself. Now, I am a tightly wound type A person and I get worked up when things do not go according to my plan. But are we willing to pause and are we willing to admit that there is an inner leprosy in us all? Are we willing to admit that there's an inner leprosy that's being instilled by Western civilization in us all and it's the leprosy of pride and self-sufficiency? Naaman is angry because he has been completely self-sufficient in his life to this point. But when you're self-sufficient, you can't be God-reliant. When you're self-sufficient, you can never be God-reliant. Naaman had coasted through life at this point, 100% self-sufficient, with no need for God. And Christian, you may be sitting there saying, well, that's, that's Naaman, that doesn't sound like me. But the reality is that I don't think Christians, I don't think we're exempt from this either. Think about the times that you've asked God for a miracle in your life. Think about the times you've asked God to provide for you 
in your life. And then God shows up and he meets you at your point of need and he provides a miracle in your situation and he begins to provide for you and you begin to experience his favor and and success in your life. And then slowly over time, what happens? We begin to slowly edge God out because our sinful impulse as fallen creatures is to finish what God started on our own and then to take credit for it. So Christians, we're not exempt from this either. Because when you're self-sufficient, you can never be God-reliant. And the last thing I want us to see is this. The king was outraged by something that was beyond him. He said, am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Can I, can I heal this man? No. The king was outraged by something that was beyond him. Naaman was outraged by something that was beneath him. He said, you want me to do what? You want me to dip in that muddy excuse for a river out there, don't you know that I'm an Ish Gadol? Maybe we should pause and ask this question. Are you willing to listen to and obey God if he speaks through someone that seems smaller or less significant than you? Are you willing to listen to and obey God if he speaks through someone that seems smaller or less significant than you? Let that simmer in your heart for a second and see if pride doesn't bubble to the surface. Because parents, I'm a parent and I know this is true. If I would stop and I would listen, I know that God has things that he wants to say through my kids to me if I'd only give them the time. Husbands or wives, are you willing to stop and listen to what God wants to say through your spouse to you? Are you willing to listen to and obey God if he speaks through something or someone that seems less significant than you? Naaman saw this servant as smaller or less less significant or less important than himself. And he saw this task of dipping in the river less significant than what a man of his stature deserved. Naaman is standing on the doorstep of a miracle, but he's willing to go 90 miles back to Aram with leprosy still on his skin because of something that seemed beneath him. Do you see yourself at all in this story? I have to ask myself this question. Am I willing to sacrifice my family? Am I willing to sacrifice my job? Am I willing to sacrifice the call of God on the altar of pride because of my unwillingness to do something that seems beneath me? Are you willing to sacrifice the things that God is saying is important in your life on the altar of your pride because you feel like they are beneath you? Look at what happens next. Naaman is headed back to Aram in a huff. He is angry. But in verse 13, it says this, Naaman's servants, say servant, went to him and said, my father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, if he had come out and you know, done this giant spectacle and put on this big show, uh, if he told you to do this great thing and they're, they're kind of pointing out his pride here in the story, would you not have done it? How much more than when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? They said, Naaman, If he had asked you to do this great thing, wouldn't you done it? Wouldn't you have done it? Well, why won't you do this small thing? Why wouldn't Naaman? It's because his instructions seemed foolish to Naaman. 1 Corinthians 1.18 tells us, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. The simplicity of the gospel, the simplicity of God's grace always seems foolish. In a world that seeks the extraordinary, God always chooses to use the ordinary. In the world that seeks the extraordinary, God uses the things that seem foolish in the eyes of the world to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. Why does he do this? He does this to humble us. He does this to uproot the pride in our heart that may be an obstacle to us coming to him. And the story goes on. Although Naaman thought that these were foolish instructions, he listened to his servant. And then in verse 14, it says, So he went down, dipped himself in the Jordan River seven times, as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored, and he became clean like that of a young boy. As Naaman came out of the water that seventh time, after dipping six times, the seventh time, he discovered this simple but profound truth. If what you want is anything other than God, you'll never have what you need. Because for Naaman's entire life, he had everything he ever wanted, but nothing that he needed. And it was in this moment of performing this foolish task 
that he realized that if what you want is anything other than God, you'll never have what you need because all the power, all of the wealth, his position, his title, his stature, none of that could heal his skin or his sin. Friend, I'm asking that you believe that truth today, that if what you want is anything other than God, you'll never have what you need. Verse 15 says, Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. So please accept a gift from your servant. So this is Naaman's conversion moment. This is when Naaman is converting from the pagan gods of Aram to the one true God of Israel, to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because he accepted the simplicity of the grace of God. And then in verse 17, there's this odd request that Naaman makes. Naaman said, please let me, your servant, everyone say servant, be given as much earth as a pair of mules can carry, for your servant will never again make burnt offerings and sacrifice to any other God but the Lord. In 2010, my wife and I lived in Michigan, and we were pregnant with our first child. Let me pause there. Do you notice how it's only men that say we were pregnant? (laughs) Yeah, we, we were pregnant. We were equally pregnant with our first child. Yeah, equally pregnant. And women are like, what's this, what's this we stuff you're talking about here? Let's be honest. If men got pregnant, morning sickness would be the nation's number one health problem and the number one reason for absences from work. Maternity leave would last two years and with full pay, children would be kept in the hospital until they were potty trained, and men would stay in bed for the entire pregnancy if they were pregnant. So women who are actual rational, logical beings say things like, we were expecting. So back to 2010, my wife and I were expecting our first child in Michigan. And so the time had come, and she went into labor. We went to the hospital, and we were so excited to welcome our first son into this world. And she labored for over 30 hours in the hospital. And the doctor and the nurse came in one night, in the middle of the night, and they said, hey, not to belabor this anymore, pun intended. Um, They said, we're going to take you in and you're going to have to have a C-section. So we're going to go get the operation room ready and we'll we'll come get you in just a minute. So I grabbed this bag that I brought with me to the hospital and followed this nurse out in the hallway. And I said, hey nurse, really quick, I have a question. Uh, My wife and I, we live in Michigan, but we're actually from Texas. And I brought this bag of dirt here from Texas. And I was going to put it under our hospital bed so that we could say our son was born on Texas soil. This is a true story, by the way, Texas soil. So I just want to make sure that now that we're going to the operating room, if I can still take this bag of dirt and put it under the operating table. And she looked at me and she said, no. And I said, well, why not? And she said, well, the operating room is a sterilized environment and dirt can have all kinds of bacteria and other contaminants that would make it no longer a sterilized environment. And I said, okay, I'm sorry, you obviously misunderstood me. I didn't say this was a bag of dirt from New Jersey. I said that this was a bag of dirt from Texas where everything is clean and everything is pure and everything is perfect. So can I bring it and put it under the bed in the operating room? And she looked at me and said, you're not in Texas anymore and this child will be born on Michigan soil. But the story ends well because God loves us and he is good and he brought us back to Texas so we could raise our sons on Texas soil. But Naaman carries this dirt back from Israel to Aram because he wants to memorialize this experience, this encounter he had with God. He's saying, I'm I'm a citizen of the kingdom of Aram, Aram, but in my spirit, I know that I'm a citizen of a different kingdom the kingdom of the God of Israel. I live in in Aram, but my heart is set on the coming kingdom. God wants you to memorialize the experiences with him in your life. Those, that your conversion moment or those moments when God did a transformative work and showed up in a big, powerful way in your life. He wants you to memorialize those and he wants you to carry those in to the next phase of your life. Because the same God that met you where you were is the same God who will be with you wherever you are going. So so, um, Naaman took this dirt back to scatter in Aram. 
Genesis chapter two tells us that man was created from the dirt. And Acts chapter eight says that God took these people that were created from dirt and scattered them across the earth to establish the early church. Christians, you are the dirt. God is scattering his people to be servants in a world of ishgadols, people who have been humbled by the grace of God and the simplicity of the gospel. I like to play this game when I read Old Testament scripture of where's Jesus in the story? Because I believe every story in the Old Testament points to Jesus in some way. So when we consider 2 Kings chapter five, and we ask the question, where is Jesus in the story? And we look at the characters, we begin with the kings and say, well, he wasn't found in the king of Aram or the king of Israel. Uh, We look at Naaman, he was definitely not found in the person of Naaman. He wasn't even found in Elisha, the prophet, for he didn't even show up much or even say or really do anything. So who represents Jesus in the story? It's the servant girl. She's the picture of Christ. For this servant girl, Naaman represented everything bad in her life. She was ripped from her family. She was sold into slavery. She's serving in the house of the man that signed off on the order that led to her life falling apart. And then one day she heard that he was sick. One day she heard that he had leprosy. She could have been silent. She could have sat back and waited for that leprosy to overtake his body and for him to die so that one day she could dance on the grave of the man that brought all of this pain into her life. But this servant girl had love for her enemy. She told him the plan that would lead to his salvation. She died to herself and she was willing to help someone who harmed her. Who does that sound like to you? Sounds like Jesus. It sounds like the suffering servant in Isaiah 53, Jesus who suffered because of our sin, who bore our shame, who took on our iniquity. So in this story, the servant girl is the picture of Christ. And as we end, I want you to notice that Naaman sought kings in Aram and Israel, but in the story, God only spoke through servants. Naaman goes to somebody's in the story, but God only uses the nobodies. It's the nameless and the faceless in the story who God uses. So my encouragement to you today is to be a servant. Be willing to be nameless and faceless because it's not about you, it's all about God. It's not about us being an Ishkadol. It's all about the greatness of the name of Jesus Christ. Because if what you want is anything other than God, you'll never have what you need. Let's pray. Hey, thank you for being a part of service today. We hope that God's word met you right where you are. We hope you took something that's gonna help you move forward in God's best for your life. We wanna hear from you. There's a link right below this video you can click on. Send us a note, let us know what's going on in your world, where you're watching from, maybe even how we can be praying for you. We love believing God with you for God's best in your life. You can do that by clicking that link, sending us a short note. Hey, maybe also you've made a decision to follow Jesus recently. That excites us. We celebrate with you. We want to hear from you. We want to know what God is doing in your life. You can text the word follow to 22999. We'll respond back with a link that you can click on. Go to our website. We have some great next steps for you. How to move forward in that decision that you've made to follow Jesus, whether it's water baptism, whether it's getting in a life group, or maybe even planning in God's house right here with us in Life Track. We know whatever that next step is, God has great plans for your life, and we want to be a part of seeing all of God's best fulfilled in your heart and in your life. We hope you're doing awesome. We can't wait to see you next time. If you don't have a home church, we would love to invite you to be part of Life Family. Remember, you belong here. Join us again next Sunday or any time throughout the week. Hit that bell so you never miss when we post a new video. Hope to see you again soon.